wonderful. Well, let's uh, get started. Um, I'm here with Michael Billington, who is uh, the theatre critic of The Guardian in the UK, um, among many other fantastic um, pursuits. Michael is also a writer and wrote two fantastic books, which we're going to talk about in this chat. Um, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Have you had a chance to see any theatre over in Australia? I came to Australia first, 1982, to a very brilliant Adelaide Festival, mm -hmm. uh, which I remember clearly. Uh, I came partly because there was a new play by David Hare that year, but the, the big discovery for me was Pina Bausch, the great mm -hmm. German choreographer with the um, Wuppertaler Tanztheater. I'd, I'd never heard of them, really. And I saw about four of their productions and came back to London raving about this company. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I think myself and another British critic who were in Adelaide that year became the first people in Britain really to write about her. And then I came back to Adelaide 10 years later, and I've also been to festivals in Sydney and Melbourne and Perth. So I've always had a memorable time in Australia, actually. I've always had a very good time artistically and socially. Yeah, wonderful. Um, mate, so obviously you're, uh, you're getting along to see quite a bit of theatre, to say the least. How many, how many nights are you at the theatre these days? I probably go about four nights a week. Uh, I, I reckon 200 times a year. And I worked out uh, over 45 years, I'd been 9,000 times to the theatre. It sounds a lot. It is quite a lot. But of course, people go to the office five times a week. So, you know, I'm not doing anything that abnormal. Uh, yeah. I've just turned my obsession into my living, which is very lucky, really. Yeah. Has it become a kind of obsession? Obviously, are you, are you still in love with theatre as much now as, as maybe many years ago when you began? I think it is an obsession. Um, I mean, I, people often ask me, when are you going to retire? Because I'm now a certain age. Uh, we won't go into that. Uh, and I say, but there's always something coming up that I can't miss. You know, there's always a new play, a new musical, uh, a new company starting. And I feel there's always something in the theatre that's around the corner. The big thing about theatre, as you well know, is it's never static. It's always changing, developing, altering. And right at the moment, as I'm speaking now, you know, theatre in London is, is changing in lots of ways. And the biggest two most obvious ways are uh, towards gender equality and ethnic diversity. I mean, just to give you one example, uh, two nights ago, I saw an astonishing production of Shakespeare's Richard II play by an all-female cast and all women of colour. Now, this could not have happened. It couldn't have happened five, 10, 15 years ago, obviously, but it's happening now because, obviously, society is rapidly changing and people say, you rightly that Shakespeare has to reflect the society we live in. So that's just one example of the way theatre is always moving, never still. And that's why I can't quite give it up. <laughs> that's so thrilling to hear. It's, it's very exciting. Have you, I mean, I guess that'd be one of the most interesting things to talk with you about, having seen the, the shifts and the changes over um, a long career. I mean, do you think the, the shifts in terms of Obviously, the move towards more equality is fantastic, but the actual quality of the work that we're seeing on stages now to maybe 20 or 30 years ago, do you think it's still as vital and as exciting as ever? I think it is in lots of ways. I mean, the great thing about theatre in Britain is new writing. Every decade or every year almost now, there's another generation of writers coming through. And just as you think, well, you know, a certain generation has said what it has to say, it is replaced by another generation. Um, it's partly because, of course, we have so many venues, not least in London, that are devoted to new writing. The Royal Court Theatre is the most famous and has been there the longest. The National Theatre does now more new plays than old plays, quite truthfully. Um, and I can think of about six or seven other theatres in central London, all looking for new scripts. So in any one week, I'm not just seeing old plays, I'm seeing two or three new plays. And I think that's one of the reasons why theatre remains healthy. Mm. I mean, at my age, I get nostalgic sometimes about uh, the great performers of the past because I was lucky when I started uh, going to the theatre, Laurence Olivier, Peggy Ashcroft, Edith Evans, people of that generation were the big stars. And I look back at those performers and think, God, you know, they will never quite be replaced. Mm. But then I look around today in Britain and I see extraordinary actors coming through. And I'm sure you'll know uh, the work of many people like, like Mark Rylance or, you know, Fiona Shaw or Juliet Stevenson or Simon Russell Beale. You know, the, these are the great actors of today. So there's always an endless supply of talent in the British theatre. 
And I think very simply it's got a lot to do with our belief in subsidy, that you can't have good theatre in the end without some form of government, subsidy government support. And although it's not as much as it ought to be, that's kept going over the years. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a shift, I think, around the world. Of, uh, certainly here in Australia, there is a constant fight to uh, keep funding in theatre and it's, uh, it's a shame. But yes, it does still seem, even with your particular government at the moment, to be still funded in a, in a more positive way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I say, the funding's never enough. One thing that has changed, and I, I regret the change, is there are fewer permanent companies in the British theatre. When I started going to the theatre, all the big cities throughout the UK would have their own resident company. So, you know, you'd go to Birmingham or Liverpool or Manchester or wherever, and you'd see a group of actors working together for, I don't know, two years or more. That's now gone pretty much entirely. Uh, theatres cast each production afresh. Just one tiny example. The other day, great actor, British actor, died, as you will know, Albert Finney. And my memory is of seeing Albert Finney when he was about 20, 21 at the Birmingham Rep. And I saw him over two years playing everything from small parts to suddenly playing Henry V and the Scottish play and so forth. And you could watch the growth and development of a great actor. And then, of course, he becomes a popular film actor. That doesn't happen in the same way today. Um, actors um, don't go to the regions in the same way they used to. There aren't the companies there. And I think agents hustle actors to stay in London and take television work or voiceover work if it comes up. That, I think, is a big loss. I think we need permanent companies. And the Royal Shakespeare Company is about the only one now that has a regular team of actors. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a huge loss, isn't it? Because um, I think acting began as, it, it, well, it still is considered to me, at least, a, as a craft. And I think it, it is about putting in the time. I think it was a, an apprenticeship to begin with. A lot of the time you'd work with a theatre and I think... Um, yeah, if you're not getting that sort of hands-on experience. Um, have, you, have you seen you, that translate, though? I mean, is there a particular, like, a different style, do you think, in the acting? Have we lost something in our... Is, is the vocal strength still there on stage? Is the comfort on stage or whatever it might be still there with the young actors? I, I think it is, but what has changed most in acting in, in the UK, I think, is the physicality. Um, the acting generation that I first watched, I mean, some of them were highly physical, like Laurence Olivier, but you, they were vocal actors. Nowadays, <clears throat> excuse me, British actors are expected to, you know, swing for the trapeze upside down if need be, and they can do it. Um, I would say, <clears throat> very briefly, I think there's much more um, devotion to developing the body as, and the mind, um, and perhaps less the voice. The voice beautiful, I think, maybe has gone out of British acting. But just going back to companies, I mean, I can't say this too often. There was a company in Liverpool, the Everyman Theatre in Liverpool in the North West. And if you look at the actors it produced, I mean, they were quite extraordinary. People like Julie Walters and Pete Postlethwaite and Bill Nye and Anthony Scher, you know, who all went on to become stars in their own right. But they were all working at the same time for peanuts mm -hmm. in this smallish theatre, you know, tucked away in, in Liverpool. I mean, again, that doesn't happen now. Um, I think everyone now, wants fame, you know, they want fame quickly. Uh, they think they can probably achieve fame if they stay in London and, you know, wait for a good part in television, or if they're lucky, the movies. Um, and I wish more actors uh, were ready to uh, devote themselves to theatre, quite simply. Mm. I'm speaking of the UK only. No, totally. I mean, I think one of the, the difficulties here in Australia, I mean, I know many of the, you know, kind of top, especially the sort of really exciting young um, actors um, and even if you are the success story in theatre here in Sydney you are very likely still working a lot of part-time jobs and because we only have really three kind of major three or four major companies in Sydney you would even if you were doing back-to-back -back productions you would still be you know scraping together an income which is a bit of a shame I think here I think in England there's a bit more hope of uh, pulling together a a steady income still I'm, I'm sure very difficult but um it's difficult and i mean i have i have australian friends who you know contemplated coming here because they think there is more opportunity certainly in london and and in the british theater um what i'm saying is i mean theater in britain is still lively you know expansive there's a hell of a lot going on there are at least a hundred theaters in london every night you know, large and small putting on shows um there's a lot of activity <clears throat> 
I just think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the culture has changed in, in some ways. And I think we're in every way now a much more star-hungry, star-oriented culture. I mean, if you want to get a straight play on in the commercial theater in the West End, it's almost got to have a big star name. Otherwise, it won't stand much of a chance. It's the public, you know, they want uh, big names. I'm not being pessimistic. I think theater in Britain is lively, as I say, and varied and rich. Um, but there are certainly cultural shifts, one of which is towards the issue I've talked about already, much more equality and diversity. But at the same time, in a strange way, there's a, this sort of hunger for big names. And if they're big names from America, of course, that's even, that's even better for the management. <laughs> um, totally, totally. But I'm, I'm glad you're, you're still so um, hopeful and positive about the industry. It's great to hear. It's exciting to hear. Um, I, I would love to ask you, because you have probably seen more plays than, <laughs> than most, to be seeing four shows a week, I'm sure, for the last um, 20 or 30 years. 50 maybe. years. 50 years. Yeah. Well, there you go. Pretty and much. It's a lot of theatre and you've seen everything from the most, I'm sure, most absurd and experimental to your, you know, I'm sure you've seen about 100 Hamlets by now. Mm -hmm. You can. I, I would love to know w what makes a great play for you, if that's such a broad question, but I'd love to know what, if there's a, a criteria or something you look for when you're watching a play or whether it's an instinctive thing and something you still can't put into words. Well, I, there's no sort of rules about what makes a great play, but I did write a book recently called The 101 Greatest Plays, a very sort of arrogant title, obviously. Um, and I tried to work out whether there were any common factors. I think there are. I mean, you've got to have a protagonist in a play, male or female, who's in a state of crisis and desperation. If their lives are perfectly happy and ordinary, then that's not going to make great drama. Mm. I think the crucial thing for me, absolutely crucial, is that the public world and the private world of the characters has to be in constant interaction. And if you think back of any, of any great play, that is true. I mean, Hamlet is not just a play about a young man going through a sort of personal crisis. It's about a young man who's been actually denied uh, the throne of Denmark, you know, so he's operating on both the public and the private sphere. If you think of, I don't know, Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman, you know, that is a play about a guy whose own career is on the skids and he can't get the work as a salesman that he used to at the same time it's about america isn't it you know he symbolizes something going wrong with the american dream i wouldn't go through the whole of world drama but i mean you know you can check back i think to almost any great play and find it's that sort of intersection of the public and the private world uh, that, that makes for uh, great theater i suppose one other factor and it's not to be uh, put lightly is the language i think the great thing about drama for me, great drama is <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the richness and variety of the words people speak. They don't have to be poetic, but they've got to be vibrant and exciting. And one thing that strikes me forcibly, whenever I watch you know, a series on television, however well written it is, it very rarely has that kind of salty, tangy, uh, peculiar dialogue that you expect in drama. And I think that's one of the things we go to the theatre for. It is still a place of words, it's of great words, and all the great dramatists, I think, satisfy that need in lots of ways. I mean, those are just three examples of what makes a great play, but yeah. if, I, if I knew the recipe, I would try and write one, but I, uh, I don't know the recipe. No, it's fantastic to hear, and I'm really glad you mentioned language because we've recently, we have a little community of actors um, within Stage Milk, and we just did a Harold Pinter-themed month. And... Mm -hmm. Across the world, we have students who are kind of going, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. You know, I'm kind of everyone was pulling their hair out, I think, with his sort of general ambiguity. And it took me rereading probably about eight of his plays to sort of start to love it, as you say, just for the language. And I almost see it as I actually really love some of Pinter's poetry and mm -hmm. seeing it almost as a as a poem in a way. Because it could, but I think if, if a young actor were to watch Death of a Salesman, it's almost impossible to hate that play. It's just, you just love it or The Crucible, something which has such a natural story structure. But most people who seem to go along to see a pinter leave going, I just don't get it. I'm not sure what I'm meant to feel, but both are, you know, some of the great playwrights. Yeah, I, I think people, people agonise too much about 
Pinter, what does it mean? I mean, one of the great things about Harold Pinter is that he allows us to decide what it means. He allows us to decide what happens to the characters. If you think of one of his most famous plays, The Homecoming, at the very end of that play, the female protagonist, Ruth, um, decides to leave her husband, stay with his family in the East End of London, and apparently, apparently, agree to uh, work for them as a prostitute. And that's, that's the end of the play. But I mean, Harold Pinter leaves it up to us to decide whether it's a con trick on her part, whether she's simply exploiting this family. I don't think she'll ever become a prostitute. I think she's far too uh, canny and clever. But the point is that Harold Pinter leaves the options open, leaves it to the audience to decide. And I have a theory, which is that I think sometime in the 1950s, uh, theatre, film, fiction all changed. We no longer craved you know, resolution and explanation. We wanted things that were much more open-ended. I mean, Samuel Beckett does it in his plays. You know, will God ever come? We don't know. I always quote a, a famous film of Antonioni's La Ventura, where someone go, a girl goes missing. People go in search of her. You never find out at the end of the film what happened, why she went missing. And I think we now live in a world where audiences are open to unresolved endings. And I think that's one of Pinter's great achievements. He gives the audience the dignity of choice. He allows us to decide what happens next. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I would encourage anyone who's listening to this to go and read some of the fantastic work Michael has written on Pinter. I read a number of articles and uh, you have a book as well. You, you wrote I did a biography of Pinter, yeah. yeah. So this is the man for Pinter. So, you know, uh, we're really lucky to be chatting with Michael about the great playwright. Um, but I think that's exactly right. When I was kind of talking with actors about it, it was, it's liberating because I think you have to let go and abandon into it because if you try to understand it too much and put too much on it, um, you, you maybe will never find that anchor. I mean, you have to, as the actor, I think, do the preparation to, to make mm -hmm. your own world make sense. Um, but I think it's a great tool for actors, certainly. Well, actors, I know, love doing Pinter for precisely that reason, because you know, the questions are endless. And Harold Pinter, when he was asked, you know, and actors would go to him sometimes in rehearsal and say, look, Harold, you know, what was this character's background? Where, where, do, where does the character go next? Harold will say, I don't know. Um, it wasn't that he was hiding, you know, the secret from the actors or the, or the public. He, he himself didn't know the fate of the characters. He would say the evidence is in the play. But you hit on it a moment ago when you used the word poet and poetry to describe Pinter's work. And I think his plays are poetic in a very accurate sense of that word. The language is very precise. Uh, it mixes very sort of down-to-earth, you know, concrete speech with uh, monologues. Um, he uses all the things we use in everyday speech, re repetition and hesitation and pauses, of course, famously between words. Um, so he, he had an uncanny ear for how people talk. But at the same time, he, he chooses those words carefully. And I think it, I would think so, excuse me, the phone is ringing. I would think it's very hard to cut a pin to play because every phrase matters and is necessary. I, I actually do think that he is a, was a great dramatist, is a great dramatist, and my conviction is his plays will go on being performed in the way we go on performing Chekhov and Ibsen, because his plays tap into something that we all understand, which is a kind of insecurity, fear, anxiety. You know, a, a knock comes at the door, someone rings our doorbell. Who is it? What is it? Have they come in some obscure way to get us? It may be the postman, of course, but it might also be a, someone, you know, a stranger who's come to impose themselves on our lives. I mean, just, I, I, I wouldn't go on forever about Pinter, but the other thing he understands is that life is a constant negotiation for uh, territory and for supremacy. Mm. You know, imagine a situation, you know, A and B, two men, let's say, in a room, they're, they're fighting for supremacy. A third character, let us say, a woman walks into the room. Those two men then engage in a battle over that woman. And Harold Pinter saw that well, our daily lives are really very political because our daily lives are, are based on some kind of battle for uh, domination over uh, the situation we're in. Even something very simple. If you're in a room with someone, who sits down first? 
is the key to uh, who's lost the battle. The person who stands has gained something of the person who sits. The person, someone said, and it's true in the homecoming, whoever goes to bed last at night has somehow won a, a tiny little domestic battle, you know. If your partner goes to bed before you, they've, hum, they've somehow succumbed. If you stay up a bit later than them to have a drink or whatever, you've, some, you've won. All I Pinter's think, plays are about power, I think. I think, yeah, recently there was a production of The Caretaker on here in Sydney that I went to see. And particularly in that play, I think you see the dynamic of power um, a great deal. Um, do you think, I, I will press you, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of Pinter myself, and, and you're really the man who knows almost more than anyone about, about the playwright. Um, in, in the playing of Pinter, because you must have also come across some pretty atrocious <laughs> versions of his plays, I'm sure, some very tedious productions. Do you think, com coming from your critical point of view, there is any advice to actors playing Pinter? Well, it would be arrogant of me to tell actors how to act. Although I have actually directed some Pinter plays. I directed um, three plays with uh, drum students in London about uh, 11 years ago. And that was a really uh, enlightening experience for me. I think I learned more doing that than I did writing the book about him. Yeah, well. My only advice would be to always trust the rhythms of the language. <clears throat> in other words, don't spend all your time discussing motivation uh, or background or the future of the characters. Just follow the patterns of the dialogue and follow those pauses and silences without exaggerating them. And I think that's when the plays come alive. I mean, you can, you can kill Pinter with too much reverence. I've seen productions, the bad productions of Pinter are those where people take the word pause and imagine it lasts for, you know, 30 seconds. A pause is five seconds, if that, even that's a long time. A silence is just a bit longer. I mean, you can crush Pinter with say, sort of solemnity. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the Pinter, best, best Pinter productions I've seen have been quite light, actually, in their, in their movements and quite fast, allowing for the pauses I've talked about. Don't forget the humour in Pinter as well. A lot of his plays are about, in the immortal words of the director Peter Hall, taking the piss, to use a very English copy phrase. Yeah. Someone is always taking the piss out of someone else in Pinter. Um, I mean, it happens all the time in The Caretaker, which you've just mentioned, actually. Uh, it happens in The Homecoming. Two brothers have a fight, and it's a fight about a sausage roll. They're not really fighting about a sausage roll. What they're really fighting about is, you know, their, their history. But someone is always trying to undercut someone else. So, I don't know, listen to the language, follow the rhythms of the text, and I don't think you'll go far wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to, you kind of touched on this before, um, but a big debate I certainly hear a lot um, you know, we have a company here similar to RSC that is doing lots of Shakespeare productions. We have companies here who are constantly putting on, you know, quote unquote classics and modern classics and, and Shakespeare and so forth. And I think a lot of young actors I often hear going, oh, you know, this isn't relevant anymore or this isn't, I don't want to see another Macbeth or another Richard III. Um, mm -hmm. do, where do you sit on, on that argument? I think it's vital in any healthy theatre that you balance up the old and the new. In other words, it's, as I've said before, it's imperative that new writing is encouraged <clears throat> and happily that does happen a lot in Britain. At the same time, I think it's necessary for actors, directors and audiences to be in touch with the theatre of the past. I mean, classics become classics for a reason and it's because they have something to say to us. Um, I just saw, uh, as I said, two days ago, I saw this new production of Richard II with a cast made up of women of colour. And there's a moment in that play, which I'm sure you remember, when uh, the usurper Bolingbroke uh, has been exiled and comes back to Britain, and he really is there to claim the throne. And as I was watching this, what came to mind was an image this week uh, from Venezuela of the... Um, He's not exiled, but he, the, the, the man who wishes to be president of Venezuela, do you remember, had come back. Uh, he'd been sort of away. He'd come back to the airport. He'd been greeted by cheering crowds. The president of uh, Venezuela um, was obviously shaking in his boots, I presume, and there's a pastoral going on. Just one other quick example from that same production. There's an amazing speech in that play when John of Gaunt laments the decline of England and says England has... Uh, to, to, has destroyed itself. When I saw that production on Tuesday, Wednesday, the audience 
roared. And the reason is we're in the middle of this disastrous Brexit negotiation, which seems to have no possible ending. Britain is harming itself. And that's exactly what Shakespeare says in Richard II. I mean, you can take almost any Shakespeare play and find things that speak to us today, I, I would say. Mm. I think that's a great, a great point. Um, one other thing I really wanted to, to, to pick your brains on, and I'm sure this comes up again in the English theatre, though I, I, you know, I grew up in England and I go back quite a bit and I think the theatre generally is more vital and more exciting there. I think there is more of a culture for it. Um, but of course, there's some wonderful productions that get put on here in Australia. But one thing I hear actually sadly a lot from actors is that they don't go to the theatre, that maybe they, A, it's too expensive a lot of the time or they have given it a go and, you know, it's maybe been boring or it hasn't been. Certainly, um, they would prefer to go and watch a film, still maybe albeit a, an independent film or a foreign film. But, yeah, there's a general sentiment, sentiment here, I think, that theatre isn't exciting for the most part or we see so much bad theatre um, as actors mm -hmm. and performers. Um, do, do you think we need to do... What, what do you think? Do you think, A, it's a problem? And do you think, what, what is the soul? Do you think it's a problem in, in the the writing or the, the standard of actors or the standard of directors um, or, or it's important to have a, a, a more critical voice like yourself maybe here in Australia telling people when they're not doing it right. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well my uh, observation of actors in Britain is that quite a lot of them do go to the theatre. Mm -hmm. um, actors from what I've seen are often discontented it's, it must be very difficult, and you know this far better than I do, for an actor watching a production. If it's any good, if it's really good, the actor's going to feel envious, I presume. You know, why am I not in it? And if it's rotten and bad, you know, it just confirms his or her feelings about the theatre. I mean, it's difficult, I think, for actors to be ideal spectators because obviously they really want to be up there doing it, not watching it. Um, but I would say because of all the things we've been talking about in, in British theatre, this, sort of co this constant fluidity at the moment, um, one thing I haven't talked about much is the search for women dramatists. That's one of the biggest changes in my lifetime. When I started at The Guardian, one of the first articles I wrote, this is 1971-72, was why are there no women dramatists? I, I was deluged with, uh, in those days, letters you know, and scripts kept coming to the post and women said, of course we're writing plays. Nowadays, I would say every theatre in Britain is determined to, as I say, reflect the nature of the society. And therefore, the National Theatre, for example, says we will do 50% of new plays uh, by women, 50% by men, 50% by women. So in other words, the theatre here is so uh, sort of vibrant, uh, noisy, uh, fluctuating, that I think it, it, make, it, it, it does attract attention. The key to popular theatre, making theatre available, and this goes back to something I heard Peter Brook, the great director, say about 30 years ago. Peter Brook was asked, what was the future of the theatre? And you know what Peter Brook is like, and he's very guru-like, and he sat there with his fingers poised in front of him and thought for a long time. And he said, the future of the theatre, we all leant forward to hear what it was. He said, the future of the theatre is cheap seats. And I think the more I think about that, the more I think he's right. Theatre will survive and thrive if we can make it available and uh, economical, you know, popular uh, to go to. Um, I mean, once, once theatre gets into the ridiculous realm, I don't, people on Broadway, I gather for premium seats, now pay, you know, up to a thousand dollars. Is that right? You know, and this yeah. tends to happen in commercial theatre everywhere. Ticket prices go up. But thank God, in Britain, there are lots of theatres that deliberately offer cheap seats. You can go to the National Theatre in Britain now, I think, on the cheap seat for 12 or 15 pounds. Yeah, there's a lot more initiatives in, in the UK, which is fantastic to support that. I think here there are some, but I think it's often very difficult and you have to go through loopholes and apply to have an artist pass or, you know, ring up on a certain mm -hmm. morning. Um, yeah, I, I, I find it... Uh, obviously, they're, they're trying to make some money as well, but it, it is sad because actors, I mean, I went to one of the top drama schools here in Australia, um, and my peers, generally speaking, don't go to the theatre unless they get 
you know, a comp ticket from a friend um, yeah. or there's something they know someone or they're very eager to see it. Um, I think it is a real shame that, yeah. That yeah. I think, I think it does. It does often come down to money, you know, quite simply. I mean, actors, like a lot of people are, you know, often not well off. If the tickets were free or cheap, they would go much more often. Um, I've just noticed audiences have changed in the UK. I mean, young people now go to the theatre in much greater numbers than when I was growing up. But I, I went to theatre, I was sort of an oddball, I still am, um, because I went to the theatre when my mates were going, you know, to movies or to gigs or whatever, or sitting in coffee bars. Um, I was bicycling to Stratford to watch, you know, Shakespeare. Um, but now I look around uh, theatres in, in, you know, in London, especially, and you see a lot of young faces. I mean, one theatre is called The Young Vic, and obviously its aim is to get as many young people in as possible, which it does. And there's all kinds of concessions and cheap seats, mm. cheap deals available. Just one thing we haven't mentioned, which I think has affected the way theatre is seen, and that is uh, these live screenings of performances, which I know, you know, you in Australia will be getting live showings of yeah. the National Theatre in Great Britain. And that seems to me another way for people to see um, theatre. I think this is one of the greatest innovations in my lifetime, actually, the fact that theatre can happen in one city and be available in another at a reasonably, I hope, reasonably affordable price. No, they are, yeah. And, um, and it's amazing how many people... You, I had a, a friend from my drama school who just saw the uh, recent production at The National and how excited she was. She was like, oh, it reminded me why I want to be an actor. And I would say very rarely I see that reaction uh, in the foyers of theatre companies here. Maybe that's a little bit to do with, um, you know, not supporting our own industry enough or something, but, but it is. It's a very high calibre of theatre coming out of the national and the RSC. Yeah. It's great to I, I hope it becomes... So I hope it becomes a global phenomenon. In other words, if, if you live in London, you can watch NT Live, National Theatre Live. We now get showings from the Comédie Française in France, you know. And I would hope, why can't I sit in London and watch the Sydney Theatre Company's best work? You know, why can't all work now be made, the best work of all the major cities be made available via this circuit? I think it is a tremendous innovation. You know, you don't have to be physically in a place to go and see the theatre. Yeah. Now, a question, we, we're mostly going to have um, young actors listening to this interview, and I'm sure a lot of them, certainly the ones in the UK, are, are dreaming one day of getting a five-star Guardian review from Michael yeah. Billing. In terms of actors' performances, do you again have any criteria with what you're kind of looking for there in, in, a, in a great performance? I look in acting for... A, a personality that is intriguing and fascinating. I mean, obviously, you take technical skill for granted. You know, you take it for granted that actors have been to, have been to drama school, you know, and know how to use their voice and their body. You know, that should be a given. But what I'm then looking for is uh, some quality of personality. Quoting David Hare, the British dramatist, once again, he once said to me, acting is a judgment of character. What he meant by that was who you are as a human being is, is that's what will show in your work. I mean, he was using it, I thought, slightly unfairly to say that in their old age, actors like Ralph Richardson and John Gilgood uh, were more interesting than Lawrence Olivier because they had more interesting characters. I, I disagree with him on those examples, but I know what he was saying. And I find this all the time. Henry James, the great novelist, who was also a critic, said somewhere, that one test of an actor is, would you like to meet them? Would you like to have dinner with them? And I don't think he meant that in a sort of crude way. I think he meant, you know, are they sufficiently interesting as people to make you want to know more about them? And that's my theory of an acting, really, and it applies to men and women equally, that there has to be some ingredient in their personality that makes you want to know more. And I've met, obviously, a lot of actors, you know, through, through the nature of my job, and I've always found that the most, the best actors always have uh, complicated, interesting, intriguing personalities. I wrote a biography of one great British actress, Peggy Ashcroft, and Peggy was an extraordinary woman. You know, a great classical actress, uh, a political progressive, a woman who had quite a colourful life all around, you know. And that 
convinced me, you know, Peggy's greatness as an actress was partly to do with the person she was. So I don't know whether that constitutes advice, but I'm just saying that if you're an actor, it's not just about technique, it's also about personality. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually incredibly interesting how many times we, we get to interview some really phenomenal actors now with Stage Milk being as big as, big as it is and directors and, and you know, um, yourself. And it's amazing how much that exact point comes up. And I think um, a lot of, um, in terms of auditioning, a lot of directors often talk about oh, who looks interesting to work with or who has an interesting dynamic as they walk in the room. Um, and it's funny because that might seem superficial to some people listening, but I think it's about kind of being true, as you said, with the David Hare advice, being true to kind of who you are and being open with that on stage. Because it's not about, um, I'm sure you've seen great actors who, they're certainly not playing themselves in everything, but they're bringing something interesting to every role. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to one of the great books about acting, Stanislavski, My Life in Art, which I haven't read for a long time, but my memory is he, he encouraged those actors in the Moscow Art Theatre not just to become, you know, technically perfect, but again, he encouraged them, I think, to go and go to galleries, to museums, to look at pictures, to read books, you know, to become much more rounded human beings. Because the more rounded they were as people, then he argued, the better they'd be as actors. And it seems to me it's just um, common sense advice. And if I look at just some of the, I mean, to quote some examples, you know, who, who are the British actors we all talk about? But Mark Rylance is one. I don't know Mark Rylance very well, but Mark, everyone, I do know that he's a very sort of complicated human being uh, with a lot of interest in sort of uh, mystical things, let's say, and, you know, uh, observes the, uh, you know, the planets and observes the summer equinox, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, he is obviously a really uh, unusual, uh, you know, idiosyncratic person, and that I think shows in his acting. And I could go to all the actors, you know, who we talk about in London and say the same thing. Yeah, I think, and just one brief thing I'd add, and I suspect it's true in Australia. I think intelligence is something we don't talk about enough when we talk about acting. And there's a whole generation of actors in Britain who have come through, you know, universities. Um, some that haven't even been to drama school, but they've cut, Ian McKellen, the famous example, you know, went straight from university into theatre. Um, and they bring to the act, their acting a quality of intellectual exploration and, you know, good minds. And I think the idea used to be in the past that if you were over intellectual, it, you know, affected your acting. I don't see that at all. I think many of the best actors I know have incredibly sharp, bright minds and intelligences. Yeah, I mean, I think even, as we were talking about before, a lot of Harold Pinter's stuff, and I think you see it when you see an actor, the, the, the intellectual standard of Pinter, you, to, to, to get anywhere close to being able to perform that, I think you have to be, and same with Shakespeare, the amount of imagery and uh, the use of language, however good you are as an actor and connecting with emotion, I think if you don't have that the intellect and the uh, kind of imaginary uh, agility, I think you mm -hmm. can't get up there. You can't compete with these, these greats because they're just operating yes. at a high level. I mean, also, I mean, all the best actors I know in Britain have something unusual about them. They're not sort of stock types. I mean, I'm just thinking of some of the famous uh, women examples. Judy Dench. You know, Judy Dench, to put it bluntly, is a very stocky, short lady you know you wouldn't expect her to be able to play cleopatra or you know lady m in the scottish play etc but of course she, she does brilliantly you know because she has going back to what i've been saying earlier a really interesting mind and personality maggie smith is this sort of slightly lean uh, uh slightly acidulous uh type but you know always fascinating to watch another uh, friend of mine actually eileen atkins another of the dames you know has has again a very sharp precise analytical mind but they're what my point is you know they're not stock types they're all very uh, different complicated human beings and that i keep coming back to this that seems to me the essence of really good acting yeah that's so thrilling to hear michael i could talk all night it's uh, it's fairly late late at night here in sydney i you're just such an exciting um person to be interviewing but but i'll finish with one final question because uh, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, what, why do you think, obviously, you personally are uh, obsessed with the theatre and have committed your life, really, to the theatre? What do you think the theatre can do 
you know, you're obviously very well read and you watch great films and I think you may even review films occasionally. Um, what can theatre do that these other forms can't do? And what would you say to someone who maybe isn't seeing theatre right now to maybe get them back into the, into the fold? I think theatre can change your view of yourself and it can change your view of the world outside. I mean, those two things I think are crucial. It, I, I can put it more simply, there was an American critic, Robert Brustein, who said, the great thing about theatre is that it can, it can rearrange consciousness. Mm. And in two words, that, that says it. I mean, a good evening in the theatre changes you in some way. I don't mean that you sort of walk out of the theatre saying, you know, Eureka or I'm a new person, but it, it changes your attitude. It helps you to understand yourself, your own problems. It makes you realize you're less alone in your problems. It also can make you look at the world beyond in a very different way. And I think one of the great things about modern theater, modern drama, wherever, you know, in Britain, in America, in Australia, is that it, it, it's very busy examining the world we live in. A lot of the plays I see in Britain are about society as well as about the individual. And I, I would just say one other thing. I think theatre can teach you a lot. I mean, I don't know much about nuclear physics, but what little I do know has come from watching plays by Tom Stoppard and Michael Frayn and others. Just one last quote, and this goes back to Laurence Olivier. He said, theatre is the first glamorizer of thought. And I thought that was a great phrase. It glamorizes thought. It can take an idea which you might not want to, you know, read about in the abstract, but you see it on stage and it comes alive. Theatre can do all those things, as well as giving you fun, pleasure and enjoyment. Michael, I love it. I'm going to trawl back through this whole interview and write down all the marvellous uh, quotes from yourself and from, from others you brought up. There's been so much um, gold in there. I've truly enjoyed this this conversation thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me and hopefully um we will get to collaborate maybe in the future but uh thank you so much thank you thank you very much for listening to me and thank you for your delightful questions as well it's been great pleasure great fun